Right, good morning, learners. I am Rich Kroen. I'm a history teacher at Dr. Block here in Bloemfontein in Heidedal. And today I'm going to do the topic on the black consciousness movement with you. Um, when uh, looking at this topic, there are three aspects I would like you to, to be focused on. First, the philosophy of black consciousness. What was black consciousness all, uh, all about? Uh, and what kind of influence did it have on, on, um, on South Africa, on the liberation struggle? How did it help South Africa in the long run, long run to achieve democracy? Then uh, we have to look at Steve Biko and his influence. As we know, he was the one that came up with this whole philosophy on black consciousness. He wrote uh, all the letters and, and uh, what we will discuss. And he, he was the main role player in the black consciousness movement. And then I would also like us to look at what happened in Soweto in 1976, because that whole uprising that was started there was uh, a as a result of the black consciousness movement. Uh, right, so let us first start with the philosophy of black consciousness. What was it all about? Uh, if you can look with me, uh, uh, what was or what is black consciousness? Uh, philosophy or ideology, as preached by Biko, Steve Bantu Biko, in, S in South Africa, uh, which promoted pride in culture. Uh, he wanted blacks to be proud of their culture, to not feel ashamed of their culture um, and their history, to be self-reliant, to not rely on those white liberals or any other uh, we, um, people, but to, to achieve their own freedom not to rely on, 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 on other role players, to have dignity and self-confidence in their abilities. He, I, black consciousness was aiming for, for blacks, it was for them to become confident in their abilities, to not doubt themselves, that they know that they can do anything what the white man could have done, they could, have, they could also have done. Um, in some cases also they could have even do it better, right? Uh, blacks freeing themselves not only from a psychological oppression but also physical oppression. Now this is very important. Uh, as you know, apartheid was all about oppressing black people, um, psychologically but also physic physically. Now the physical part was where they were told they cannot walk um, certain areas. Um, they were sent to different schools. Um, in all aspects of life, they were discriminated against. But psychologically, I believe, was more important in the sense that that is what blacks had to change the way that they were thinking about themselves. Um, the challenge is not if a white person would have told a black person that he is inferior. The challenge would be if that black person starts to believe that he is inferior. As you know, apartheid was all about Black, uh, whites, the government wanted to make black people believe that they cannot do what the whites were doing. They wanted to, to make them believe that they are inferior to the white man, they can't become doctors, they can't become lawyers, all of those things. And then the challenge was when some blacks started to believe in this inferiority. Uh, when, they, when they believed this, it was very easy, easy for the government to, to control them. There is nothing more powerful than to control a person's mind. And that is what Biko wanted to change. Is he wanted blacks to change the way that they think about themselves. They had to start thinking differently about themselves. And only then will they be able to overcome apartheid. Right. The origins of black consciousness, whether it all start, uh, Steve Biko, we, we now started it here in South Africa, but he was a very educated person. He, he studied medicine. Um, he read a lot of books. And, and, and these ideas he, he got from other countries. Right, so it stems from the American educator W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, eval evaluation of double consciousness of American blacks being taught what they feel inside to be lies and cowardice of their race. Insistence of black people to take pride in their blackness 
that we will also see in the black consciousness. You know, Steve Biko had that famous um, quote of his uh, where he said, black is beautiful. Um, it was echoed also by Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, the, and the Black Panthers. Um, as you know, you are also doing, some of you might also be doing that theme of the civil rights movement in America, um, the black power movement specifically. So they came first, and Steve, uh, Steve Biko, seeing what happens in America and in other parts of Africa, um, wanted to apply these ideas also to, to South Africa. You must remember that the, the civil rights movement in America, the black power movement, they, were, they came first. Then also we know all other countries in Africa gained independence long before South Africa gained their democracy in 1994. So, you know, what was happening in South Africa uh, was different from what was happening in the rest of Africa. The whole of Africa was gaining independence from, the, from colonial rule. And here at the southern tip of Africa in South Africa, apartheid was just becoming worse and worse and worse. They were, they were, um, they were becoming more and more strict with laws of segregation and, and so forth. Right, then um, Biko promoted this. I, I said this to you, black is beautiful, you know, to teach black people that there's nothing wrong in being black. Many black people would have felt maybe it would have been better for them if they, if they had been white. Now this he didn't want. He wanted them to be proud of their skin color. Right, the origins on the black universities, like the Zululand, the uh, University of Western Cape and Fort A., uh, you must remember, guys, Steve Biko was at university. Um, when he was at university, he saw the restrictions that there was on black students. He saw how few black students there were studying at this tertiary institution in comparison with the whites. Even at the universities also, there they were segregated, there were separate facilities, and he saw how unequal this was. Um, that, that the white students, they always had better facilities. They had more opportunities. And this he wanted to change. But in order to change this, he had to change first the mindset of the blacks. Um, they had to start to believe that they can go to tertiary institutions. Uh, right. Then um, the philosophy, it was an attitude of mind rather than a political movement. Like I've said now, he wanted blacks to change their mindset, most importantly. Like I've said, to believe in themselves, uh, to, to be self-reliant, not to, to rely on those white liberals, but to take matters into their own hands. First, first thing, f firstly, they had to change their mindset. Right? It cannot be defined within the narrow description of a political party. Uh, many politic or many po many organizations was born out of the ideology or the philosophy of black consciousness. Movement embraced all those who were opposed to the oppression of blacks, defined black as all those oppressed by apartheid. Like I always ask to learners, good coloreds and Indians have become part of the black consciousness movement. Yes, because they were also oppressed by apartheid. Good whites. No, because whites were never oppressed during apartheid. They could, have, they could have liked the movement, but the movement was strictly for those that were oppressed. Right. Then uh, the main obje objectives of the black consciousness movement, they wanted to raise confidence to bring about black confidence to bring about liberation. Black people, if they could start to believe in themselves, they will gain freedom. As you know, liberation meaning freedom once they start to have confidence in their own abilities, only then will they be free. Right, promote pride in black identity, culture, and history. history. Um, to say to blacks that there's nothing wrong with you being bl uh, bl black, you can be proud of the fact that you, are, that you are black, you can be proud of your culture. As you know, a black person's culture can be a lot different from a white person's culture. Uh, they wanted to teach the blacks that you must be proud of your culture. You shouldn't try to run away from your culture or from your history. Right? To challenge the white liberals, 
as you know, uh, when Steve Biko was at uh, university, there were white liberals they, that, that might have wanted to help him, th that wanted to help blacks to, to gain freedom. But what he said or what he believed is that in order to stop apartheid quickly or discrimination quickly and segregation, to stop it at a, at a quicker pace, they would have to take it into their own hands. They would have to be a lot more radical, right? To promote black unity, uh, Ibiko believed that blacks would, first of all, have to come together to fight the oppression. They cannot have, we cannot have the Sutus and the Kors and all the different ethnicity groups fighting against apartheid separately because then, then they will not be effective. Also said that um, if you read there, there can never be black white unity before there is black unity. So the blacks and the whites could not live together in peace and what if the blacks themselves cannot live together. It was very, very important for him to see that blacks from the different uh, groups in South Africa, the different um, groups come together and, and, and together fight against this oppression. Right, what influenced the movement? It was a grassroots anti-apartheid activist movement that emerged in South Africa in the mid-1960s. Right, um, it emerged in the 1960s. I believe it became a lot more effective in the 1970s. Out of the political vacuum created by the jailing and banning of the ANC and the PIC, leadership after the 1960s Sharpeville massacre. Now, as you all know, uh, Nelson Mandela and um, Walter Sisulu and all those uh, guys that were sent to Robben Island, they left in the black resistance. There was, a, there was now a, a gap because there was no opening there. Nothing happened for, for a certain time frame because Mandela was in prison. The ANC was banned, so blacks couldn't belong to any party as the ANC was banned and the PIC was banned. So for, for a certain time, the, the black resistance in South Africa was very, very uh, quiet um, as the government tried to just get rid of it. And, and, and they succeeded to a certain extent. The ANC went into exile where they couldn't be as effective as they were um, with their leaders in prison. So, so this actually created the opportunity for Bika and them to come to the forefront, right? It represented a social movement for political consciousness so that um, blacks can be made aware of what were their political rights, right? Um, then you will have to look at some of the organizations that was born out of the black consciousness movement. First of all, we had SASU, which was established in July 96, uh, 1969. Uh, the South African Students' Organization. Now, they were at the universities. Um, Biko, the, 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 the founder of this organization, um, Rampela, Mam, uh, Rampela, um, Mampela Rampela, sorry, with, with him, they, they started the, the, the SASU organization. Um, not so many blacks could have joined into SASU because, as I've said, not many blacks in the 90s, end of the 1960s and the beginning 1970s were at these tertiary institutions. Most of them, they didn't go and study. Most of them didn't even finish school. So Sasu, Sasu was not on a large scale. They didn't draw large numbers at first as it was for university uh, students. And like I said, not many blacks because of apartheid were able to get to the universities. Right, then also the Black People's Convention, um, this, the South African Students' Movement, SASUM, and then the National Youth Organization. Right, we must remember that black consciousness, the challenge for the government of the black consciousness movement came when the black consciousness movement reached the masses. You know, when it reached the school learners, we will look at Soweto. That is where the actual challenge came. At first, the, the, the government weren't threatened by the black consciousness movement because, as you know, the government believed in separate development. So when they heard there's an ideology or movement only for blacks, 
th that was actually for them, they were comfortable for that because that is what they wanted as well. But later on, when they saw the masses and, and what it actually entailed, they, they started to feel a lot more threatened. And, and you will have to look at how did the government also react to the black consciousness movement. Very important, you can note that down to say, what were the government's reaction towards the black consciousness movement? What did they do? How did they try to get rid of the black consciousness movement? Um, to, to stop the ideas of spreading. You know, um, we know what happened in Soweto, and we will get to it later on. We know what happened to Steve Biko. So there's no doubt that the government was threatened by the black consciousness movement. Otherwise, why would they have arrested so many of their leaders? Um, yeah, we will get to that. Right, Sasu. So let's first look at Sasu. It came as the, res as the result of the split from NUSAS. Now, NUSAS was the National Union of South African Students. They were also a liberation movement. They wanted equality, um, freedom at the universities. Steve Biko, oh, let me first say it was a multiracial um, organization at the university. So any, any um, black, white, colored, Indian, whatever, could have joined NUSAS. Steve Biko joined NUSAS. But the leadership of NUSAS was still predominantly white. And that is why Steve Biko broke away from NUSAS to form his own organization. Right, as you can read there, um, it was dominated by white students. NUSAS, they wanted freedom, they wanted liberation, they wanted equality at the universities, but they were dominated by white students. And you must remember, at the universities, as Biko and them came there, they, when they went home, they still went home to the townships. While the white students that were part of New South, they went to their suburbs, which was, which was obviously a lot better. Uh, as they didn't really see the effects of apartheid. They didn't see um, how bad these blacks were living in the township and, and so right. Once, um, once Sasu was established, it grew rapidly at the black university campuses that we, that we have mentioned. Right. For the first time since the banning of the ANC and the PIC, um, open black resistance was reignited. So, like I said, there was a vacuum. When, when the, when the um, ANC and the PIC was banned, not a lot was taking place in the black resistance. Um, for a certain time period. Like I said, Mandela and them being in prison, uh, people were scared. They, they didn't want, you know, um, to, to be sent to prison like Mandela and them. So many of them fled the country. Many of them were underground. They weren't effective anymore. Now, all of a sudden, there was black resistance again with Sasu. Like I said, Biko became the president. But I, I really, I want to emphasize this. You should not forget his reasons for splitting from NUSAS. He did not have a problem with NUSAS. As such, the thing is just he wanted an organization solely for black people, where whites could not join in. Because, like I, I'll, I'll repeat myself, but like, the, like I've said, the, the white students did not see the challenges that the blacks were facing always. They didn't go into the townships. They didn't use the separate facilities, you know, at, at, the, you know, at the campuses and in town and wherever. They didn't have to be off, um, off the street at a certain time. Right. Then the Black People's Convention, another organization that was born out of the black consciousness um, movement, um, was the Black People's Convention. They spread, the spread of ideas of black consciousness through community occurred princ principally through Black People's Convention. Right. So they wanted to uplift the, 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 um, the community, the black communities. You know, as we know, in the townships, you, know, you won't find as many hospitals. You won't find as many clinics. Um, the, circumstances in the circumstances in the township is a lot worse than what it will be in town, right? And, and they wanted to uplift the, 
the, the spirits of these black people that were living in the township, right? It was uh, made of different cultural, educational, and religious organizations, uh, right? So, yeah, self-help projects such as the Zanempile Community Health Clinic near Kings Williamstown were started. Also, what they wanted to do was to show other blacks that they can do anything what the white persons were doing. You know, most uh, all the clinics were 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 were, were run by, by white people. You know, the doctors were white. So what did Beaker and them try to aim through through projects like this is to show, but they are black and they are running the clinic. So if they can do it, you can do it as well. You know, if 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 Beaker was studying medicine, people could have seen, but he's a black person and, he, he, and he's also he's studying medicine. So. What the government is trying to, 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 when the government is trying to tell them that they cannot become doctors and these things, they will start questioning it by, by seeing that Beaker and them are studying medicine. So, so why can't they do it? As you can read there, the Zanempila Community Health Clinic, it was the first black-owned and black-run clinic in South Africa. All the others were, were, were owned by the government and they were run by whites. So they, the two things I, I want to repeat here, they, they were trying to uplift the, the black communities, obviously the townships and wherever, but also to show them that they can do the same things what the, gov um, what the government is doing. Blacks can then actually do the same things that whites were doing. Right. Then we have um, SASM, the South African Students Movement. It was formed to provide an organization for high school pu pu uh, pupils. Now, this was the actual challenge for the government um, because now it was reaching the masses, right? It gained a presence in a number of schools, including Isaacson, Isaac Morrison High School and Aleri High School in Soweto. Um, it spread the ideas of black consciousness through meetings and newspapers, you know, uh, you can you can also take note of the of the Sasu newsletter, uh, which was spread, and and then black consciousness ideas just reach so much more people, right? Uh, the government, and remember that question I said you must also always look at what were the government's reaction towards black consciousness, and if you read they 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 banned the newspaper and they imprisoned or banned the leaders of Sasu of Sasu, you know, Steve Beaker was detained a number of times um, before the last time when he was, when he was uh, killed, right? So the government really felt threatened by Sasu, by Sasu, um, by BPC. All of these posed a threat to the government. And, 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 and how, can they, how can they deal with this? By imprisoning their leaders, by trying to stop the ideas of black consciousness of reaching more and more people. So if, if a person was too verbally, he was spreading too many ideas like Biko, what would they do? They would detain him. They would, um, they would arrest him and, and, and try to keep him silent because he is spreading the ideas of black consciousness. Um, the government didn't want blacks to believe that they can be self-reliant. The government wanted blacks to believe that they need the white government. Right, then um, uh, Sasum supported the student boycotts. And from Sasu we find the Soweto Students Representative Council, which is very important, the SSRC. And uh, we, will go, we will go into this, which then planned the mass demonstration on the 16th of June, um, protesting, protesting against the uh, uh, Bantu education, um, which where blacks were taught, where blacks were forced to be taught half of their subjects in Afrikaans, where, where blacks were not given the opportunity to take subjects such such as um, maths and physical science, because the government said that blacks will never use this um, these subjects. They can rather take subjects such as uh, consumer studies. Uh, because that is what the black people will use in, 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 in their lives. They will be servants. Uh, they will not become doctors. Why do they then need 
physical science, uh, maths, um, if they're never going to become doctors. So blacks were not really um, encouraged to take subjects, uh, in many cases not allowed to take subjects such as maths, physical science. And then also being forced to be taught in Afrikaans posed a, a huge challenge because um, you can imagine to, to have your classes in a language that you are not familiar with. What will happen is you will get bad results and then you will not be able to go to a tertiary institution. Right. Um, the June 16 protest uh, was against the education policies, which we have discussed now. It resulted in the uprising against apartheid and uh, oppression. Right. Um, in, uh, and this is very important. Once again, the repression by the government. How did the government react to these different, um, to, to the black consciousness movement, to Steve Biko, to the Soweto uprising? Right, in 1977, the anti-apartheid organizations with links to black consciousness were banned, uh, which now meant that SASU, SASM, um, BPC, and the SSRC, all of them were banned organizations. So what they did to the ANC and the PAC in 1962, if I'm correct, they also now did to these uh, student movements. Uh, um, banned, you cannot be part of SASU, you cannot be part of SASM, uh, BPC, or the SSRC. If you are a member, if they can prove that you are a member of one of these banned organizations, they could then arrest you. So they were trying to, to silence the black consciousness movement, right? I believe all of you know Steve Biko in September 1977. Uh, he was also killed in police detention. Um, we already discussed the newspapers that were, that were banned. So really they tried in all ways to silence um, or to stop the ideas of black consciousness of spreading. Uh, I mean, Steve Biko, he paid with his, with his life. I would like us to look at what happened in Soweto. Many times they like to ask a specific question of Soweto, and you must be able to describe how the black consciousness movement influenced the Soweto uprising on the 16th of June 1976 because as you um, as you might know or not know but Steve Biko was never present at Soweto on the 16th of June so how do we then say that it was his ideas it was the ideas of black consciousness that influenced this uh, students of Soweto to to to, to organize a, a, demon, a mass demonstration against Bantu education right uh, why an uprising on the morning of the 16th of June 1976 thousands of black students walked from their schools to the Orlando Stadium for a rally to protest against a recently passed laws uh, that Afrikaans would be the language of instruction in all South African schools. So, on the 16th of June, learners from different schools will not attend school on that day. They will leave school and they would march to the Orlando Stadium in Soweto. They would march to show their dissatisfaction, their unhappiness with the Bantu Education Act. To show that they are not happy with the fact that they have to be taught in a language that they do not understand or a language that they feel is the language of the oppressor. Uh, many students who later participated in the protest arrived at school that morning without prior knowledge of the protest, yet agreed to become involved. So many of the students were not aware what their leaders in the SSRC were actually planning. But coming to school on the day, they decided that they, were, they, they bought into this idea of protesting against the Bantu Education Act. Right, the protest was intended to be peacefully 
and had been carefully planned by the SSRC. Right, so very important. The students of Soweto was not planning to use violence. They wanted a peaceful march to show their unhappiness with the, with the Bantu Education Act. The idea was not to, to use violence, simply to march and show their the satisfaction with, with this whole Bantu Education Act. People, you must remember that the Bantu Education Act was not only about being taught in Afrikaans or half of your subjects in Afrikaans, it was also about when you looked at the schools, the black schools, the schools in the township, and you looked at those schools in town, the so-called white schools, you would see that the, the conditions in the white schools were just so much better than the conditions in the black schools. The black schools were under-resourced. You must remember that when government gave money for, the, for, for school learners, they would give a lot more money for a white learner at school than what they will give for the black learner. So at the black schools, we had a shortage of textbooks, um, a, shortage, a sh shortage of desks, um, classrooms not uh, big enough, uh, not always electricity, you know, the, the conditions in those black schools were really, really bad. So, they had to change that, they had to challenge that, right. The, this is what one, one of the students had to say, John John. There was one teacher by the name of Mr. Modisane. He was teaching Afrikaans, history and mathematics. All of these subjects he had to teach in Afrikaans. So we tell, told him that we didn't understand this language. Couldn't he explain it in English? He said no. So I mean, we couldn't understand. Just imagine, from March until I think it was in May, we were still blank on those subjects. Uh, so it was, it was very difficult. For even, for even for an educator, which is not comfortable with the language of Afrikaans, now he has to teach in that language. So really, these learners, they were, they were neglected. They were disadvantaged through the Bantu education, through being, have to be forced to be taught in Afrikaans. Right. Um, what was interesting, a uh, quote by another student, Sibongile, what was interesting was that students had a pact that par parents should not be involved. They should not even be told about what was going to happen on the 16th. It was actually surprising to find that we all went home and kept quiet. So, the students did not want to inform their parents of the planned protest. Remember, Steve Biko targeted the youth. He wanted to, to use the youth because he knew once a person is 40, maybe 50 years old, your mindset cannot be changed. When you are young, when you are at school, or when you are at university, your mindset are still being formed. You can change the way you think about things, but not once a per It's very difficult to change a person's mindset when he has reached a certain age. Many of the older generation of, of the black people in the 70s, they were not standing up against apartheid, they, were, they, they didn't see the, um, how wrong it was. But the youth, remember also, when you are young, it's easier to, to come into, to get angry about something. So they didn't want to tell their parents because they knew their parents would stop them. Um, their parents might, might have been afraid that something would happen to them. Um, and rightfully so, because something did happen to them. Some of them were shot in Soweto, but um, their parents did not understand the way that they, they felt. They, they, they felt that their parents are too accommodating to the whole system of apartheid, and, and they should, in fact, challenge it. Right. Um, teachers in Soweto also supported the march after the action committee emphasized good discipline and peaceful Ac action, right. So some of the teachers were in fact supporting the march. Very interesting, I can tell you that these teachers were actually, some of the teachers,
come from university, came from university, they were part of SASU. And then what happened is, um, after learning or reading the SASU newsletter and learning the ideas of black consciousness, what will happen, some of these teachers, who were, first they were students, and now, now being teachers, they would go to the classroom and they would in fact also spread the ideas of black consciousness to the school learners. Remember, they came from university, um, being part of SASU, knowing the ideas of black consciousness, now they, they went and they spread those, um, these ideas of black consciousness. Sitsi uh, Masini led students from the Morrison Isaacson High School to join up with others who walked from Naledi High School. The students began the march only to find out that police had barricaded the road along their intended route. Right. So they, they had a specific route. They had to um, come together at the Orlando Stadium. Um, and then as they walked, they saw that the, the road their route that they were, they were planning on taking to the stadium has been closed. Uh, the leader of the action committee asked the crowd not to provoke the police, not, you know, not to make the police angry, uh, and the march continued on another route, eventually ending up near Orlando High School. Right. Um, the plan was, this is what Murphy Morobe had to say, he, uh, about the planned protest, another um, leader. He said the plan was that the signal time for us to start acting and moving was the singing of Inkosi Sikilele Africa in place of the us usual Lord's Prayer in the morning assembly. When the principal at one school tried to stop his students, they said to him, we have a duty to do, and they marched out. Right. So obviously some of the principals and some of the educa educators would have wanted to stop the learners from going out to school. As you know, as an educator, one has to ensure that his students or the learners are safe at school. He cannot allow them to, to just leave the school um, during school hours. Uh, but unfortunately, these educators and these principals could not have done anything about this because the students knew that they had a role to play, right? Um, the crowd of between 3,000 and 10,000 students made their way towards the area of the school. Um, they sang and wove um, place cards with slogans such as Down with Afrikaans, Viva Zania, and If We Must Do Afrikaans, Foster Must Do Zulu. As we get to the, to the yeah, one of the question papers later on, they really like to give, to give you in your exams uh, a photo, different photos of the students or the, 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 the learners that were, uh, that were marching. And then you, then you will see on these photos the slogans that they had written on the box um, place cards that said to hell with Afrikaans, um, you know, if, if we must do Afrikaans, Foster must do Zulu. You can see the spirit then amongst these uh, learners, um, singing, smiling, obviously not knowing what would happen uh, later to them, right? Uh, the police told us to disperse, um, to, go back to, 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 to go back to school, uh, but we refused. So po the police were now also becoming more and more present trying to stop the students from continuing in this march, but they refused. They were saying that, no, we are not going to intimidate anybody. We are not going to loot. We are not going to do anything wrong. We are just going to march and demonstrate and sing and then go, go back home. To demonstrate, to show your dissatisfaction, your unhappiness um, with the situation in South Africa. You know, the situation in the school, the situation in town where you are not allowed to go certain areas, but obviously mainly the, the, the unhappiness, to show the unhappiness with the whole Bantu Education Act. Right, they again said that we must disperse, but yeah, they never did. Right, um, 
um, according to the testimony of Colonel Kleingeld, the police officer who fired the first shot, some of the children started throwing stones as soon as they spotted the police patrol, while others continued to march peacefully. Right. People, w you would be asked here yeah, with this question, uh, were the police justified in their actions? Were the students justified in their actions? In other words, were the police allowed or do you believe that the, the police were right in shooting at the students um, you know many many sources will say that the that the students or the learners were in fact throwing stones uh, they were violent while others would say no but the the students were never wrong the police were wrong um, the police attempted to calm the crowd verbally or to disperse the students using dogs uh, and tear gas. These methods had no effect and one of the police, this is now what, what he said, one of the police dogs was caught, set alight and beaten to death. When police saw they were surrounded by the students, they fired shots into the crowd and panadomium broke out. Everyone started panicking and then the, 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 the situation just turned horrible. Okay, uh, the first casualty, the first person to, to have been shot uh, was Hastings Ndlovu, um, followed obviously um, by the 12-year-old Hector Peterson, which is very well known. Uh, Hector Peterson's photo, we will get to it, um, which, we, which went global. It was sent out all around the world, it, uh, for for the for the government, that that was probably one of the worst things to have happened because the government was trying to defend their policy of apartheid to say, but there is nothing wrong with apartheid, and now all of a sudden you have a picture of a 12-year-old boy shot by police um, all around the world. Everyone is saying that and say and saying that or asking, but is that what apartheid is all about? Um, about shooting innocent young uh, learners, right? Um, uh, as you can read there, the photograph taken of his body became a symbol of police brutality. Uh, it, it, it now became actually clear how brutal our uh, South African police force were during apartheid. Many of the people, even in South Africa, I believe some of the whites, were not always knowing how, how brutal apartheid actually was. And now all of a sudden you have this photograph, uh, and then also many people in the world who might not have had a problem with apartheid before, when they see this photo, they would actually start to turn against apartheid. Right. Um, the rioting continued and 23 people, including two white people, died on the first day in um, Soweto. Um, among them was Dr. Ilstein, who uh, had devoted his life to social welfare among the black population. Um, right, he was stoned to death by the mob and left with a sign around his neck proclaiming, Beware Afrikaners. Right, so um, it was during this battle that journalists reported seeing a policeman draw, draw his revolver and without warning fired, firing directly into the crowd. When you want the crowd to disperse, uh, to go back, you first have to shoot a warning shot into the air. Now, here's where a journalist said um, they saw a policeman without um, firing any warning shots. They just started firing um, into the crowd. Second later, several other policemen, policemen opened fire. That is when Hector Peterson was shot, and when he was also killed. He was crossing between the students and the police trying to go home, and the police were shooting by then. So they shot Hector Peterson. Right. People, the problem is, the question came, what kind of threat does a 12-year-old boy face to a grown policeman which is armed. When this photo came out, uh, people just said, 
how can a 12 year old boy actually threaten a, a grown policeman who has automatic weapons um, that is actually you know that was actually the challenge that 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 is why uh, I believe the the Soweto uprising is such a such a well-known or celebrated event in South Africa uh, history right uh, there is that the the photo taken of of, of Hector Peterson uh, by Sam Nzima who, who took the photo um, the lifeless body of Hector Peterson being carried there with his sister Antoinette Situle running alongside this image shocked the world symbolizing the horrors of apartheid it galvanized the world's attention to end the regime right so you know um, I forgot to say this to you but many people would say that the Soweto uprising was in fact the beginning of the end of apartheid because from here apartheid uh, just became more and more difficult for the government to continue with their policy of apartheid. Um, Soweto itself, they couldn't control Soweto. For the rest of the year, um, there was just continuing riots and the police couldn't control the situation again. Right. Uh, another photo, um, uh, which is not as well known also about Hector Peterson, um, where he is loaded into, into a car, uh, right, but you can, if I can just go back there, Muiza, um, the, the student that was carrying Hector Peterson's body, uh, who tried to, 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 um, to load it into the car, um, he became, he also felt so threatened by the government, he was so scared that he in fact left the country. Uh, if you can re read here, he feared for his life um, from the police. He fled Soweto and was last seen in Zimbabwe in 1978. Family and friends have not seen or heard of him since. Uh, there's just a picture of a, of a little um, sign that, they, that, that, that his parents brought up for him um, to commemorate his life as they do not know up until this day where he actually is. Right. The panadonomium um, uh, that broke out, the police took up positions on the hill above the school and started shooting tear gas. All hell broke loose. Uh, that was uh, um, said by Murphy Morobe. Students began to panic as they were dazed and blinded by tear gas. Students were scattered, running up and down coming back, running, coming back. It was some kind of game because they were running away, um, coming back, taking stones, throwing them at the police. It was chaos. Whenever the police shot tear gas, we jumped the wall to the churchyard. Right, there is another picture of students um, fleeing from the, from the, from the shooting um, on the day. Um, when you see your friends being shot at for just walking in the streets, it does something to you. And therefore, you would look around, what are the, what are the alternatives? Do I become like my mother? Very important, this forever under the yoke of apartheid. Remember what I said to you, Steve Beaker and them targeting the youth because they felt that the older generation would not do anything to, um, to stop apartheid. The alternative was for me not to be like my mom, great as she was, but to go and fight. Tandi uh, Mudisi on the Soweto uprising. Right, the violence. Violence escalated as the students panicked. Bottle stores and beer halls were targeted as many believed that alcohol was used by government to control black people. Uh, alcohol, they, the government didn't have a, have a problem in... in, 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 in building a lot of bottle stores in the township because they knew that um, blacks can become um, uh, what is the word um, depending on this alcohol and 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 when a person is depending on alcohol he cannot actually you know he, he doesn't have a very effective life so they they actually wanted to get rid of the of the um, of the bottle store stores um, of the alcohol, right. 
The violence aggravated by nightfall, police vans and armored vehicles patrolled the streets throughout the night. Emergency clinics were swamped with injured and bloody children. Um, it is not known how many injured children sustained bullet wounds because doctors refused to collect such details for fear that police would target the families of such uh, children. In many cases, bullet wounds were indicated on hospital records as um, abscess. Okay, right. Then also there is another picture of Soweto. Soweto, you just saw smoke on the day. Um, not a pretty sight, um, you know, um, with all the people that were shot, you know, um, things that were set alight, um, you know, at looking from the air, and I'm, I'm sure looking from a distance, uh, you, no person actually would have wanted to go into, into Soweto, right? Um, uh, and, yeah, as we go on to the next day, like I said to you, the thing is, Soweto, they were never able, the police, to really control Soweto again, right? Emotions ran high after the massacre on the 16th of June. Uh, hostility between students and the police was intense, with officers shooting at random and more people joining the protesters. The township youth had been frustrated and angry for a long time. These riots gave them an outlet. It gave them an opportunity to speak about their unhappiness, about their dissatisfaction with the whole system of apartheid. But um, obviously, specifically with the, with the Bantu Education Act, uh, the ca casualties, you know how many people died in Soweto in the year 1976, uh, which you cannot give an exact number. Remember, the government, the police, would try to make it um, less, less ca casualties while uh, trying to hide from the world, in fact, you know, how many people were killed by the police, right? But um, if we can, if we, if, if we can give a number, we can say that it can be anything up until um, 600 people that were killed in the year. 1976. Uh, and then we, just today, what do we have in Soweto today? There's the uh, uh, photo of the Hector Peterson Museum. Um, there's the famous photograph you will find there as well. Uh, Vizilikasi Street, if I now pronounce it correctly, but really a nice, you know, a, a nice tourist destination in, in South Africa. People will go there and they will go and check and, and see actually what happened on the 16th of June. Right, and then um, I just want to show you the last picture. There is a picture of his sister uh, today, Antoinette Sitole. This is not important for you, but um, just interesting to see what she looks like today um, as she is a receptionist at the Hector Peterson uh, Museum. There's also another picture of her meeting with uh, Barack Obama the President of the United States in 2006 on the 30th anniversary of the up uprising. This was when he was still a senator before he became the, uh, the president, right? Uh, but if I can just yeah, wrap it up here, the, 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 the Soweto uprising was a, the Soweto uprising was a was a, was a turning point in South African history. Um, it changed the the whole course of, of 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 resistance, and the youth were very very effective. Um, yeah, they took matters into their own hands. Um, they 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 decided to to march against this whole thing of Afrikaans. You know, you must remember the government were those people that were speaking Afrikaans. It was the language of the oppressor and. And really, they were effective. Um, it was the beginning of the end of apartheid. Okay, right. We will now just take a take a five minute break, and then we will continue um, by looking at one of the question papers, um, the paper actually of June 2014 uh, that the learners wrote last year, um, and 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 go through it um, question by question.
Right, welcome back to all our learners viewing. Right, um, what we will do now is to look at one of the old questions by question papers on the on the black consciousness movement on that um, question, looking at what some of your questions might look look like. Right, um, as you will, um, as you might know, as your teachers will tell you that this question will come for in your in your second paper. And it will be the first question. It will be a 50, 50 marks, um, which is a third of your of your marks for that paper. Sorry, and it will be it will be source based. You you will not be um, assigned to do an essay question on this. This will only be a source based question. So it's very important for you to know what to um, to have the skills to interpret your sources. Uh, correctly, so that you so that you can take the answers from the source and and be able to to re reproduce it right. So um, when we look at this paper uh, of June 2014, uh, I would start by looking at the at the addendum with you first, just reading through the different sources that's given to you, and then we will start to look at the at the question questions that is given, and then we will look at what is the the answers for these uh, different questions right so we we can start here with source one uh, a um, let us first look at the sorry before we look at the source let us first look what is the key question at the top you will always get a key question at the top now this one is to how did the ideas of black consciousness movement challenge the apartheid regime in the 1970s. So this question will be focused on how did black consciousness start to become a threat to the government, right? Um, always very important when you deal with sources is to look at from where does your sources come? Who wrote your sources? When was it written? Um, is it a primary source? Is it a secondary source? Um, is it, you know, is it first-hand evidence? Um, and those things because you will be asked about reliability is the source reliable can we trust the source um, you will be asked about the source usefulness is the source useful is it something that you in fact that you can use and that is very important then to look at first at what the source is saying to you and who wrote the source and when is that person qualified to have to have said these things you know for example if we get a source written by Steve Biko himself, we can already say that the source is useful. Why? Because it's Steve Biko, the, the founder of this movement, who wrote the source. Um, is it reliable? Uh, is it a reliable source? Um, one might say, yes, it's reliable, seeing that it's Biko that wrote it, but the other learner might feel that, no, it is not reliable. For the fact that he could have been biased, he could have been one-sided, right? Uh, but the first source we get here uh, at this specific um, paper, uh, it focuses, this extract below focuses on the philosophy of black consciousness. And if you read at the bottom of the source, you will see that it comes from The Road to Democracy in South Africa, the second volume. Um, and then they give you the 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 the... the the writer there, his name, right? But first of all, we know it's a secondary source. I've actually seen this 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 um, book. Uh, it's such a thick book, and um, I would already say that it will be reliable for the fact that this book is very acclaimed. It's a it's a well known book. Uh, many people use it in doing research, right? But what did what did they have to say? Black consciousness became a doctrine. A doctrine being a a, 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 a policy of self-emancipation and a strategy for escape from the political doldrums, which means the states of stagnation into which South Africa had been cast in the 1960s. Now, if we take this first sentence, what does it mean? Right, firstly, it became a policy. Black consciousness became a policy. Black consciousness, the ideas of black consciousness was wrote. Steve Biko, you know, he, he wrote in the Sasu newsletter numerous times, and, and these ideas were spread through, these, through this newsletters, right? Um, 
if they say do a strategy for escape from the political dolems or the state of stagnation, state of stagnation, it means that in the 1960s, South Africa, the resistance movement was very, it was standing still. Stagnation means it was standing still. There wasn't anything happening. Why? I can ask you here why. Why was there this, this, this stage of, um, or this state of stagnation? You would, with your knowledge, you are supposed to know that Mandela was in prison, the, uh, and you know, all the others, Sisulu, Govan, uh, Governor Mbeki, all of them were in prison. The ANC was banned, they were in exile, they were underground, so they weren't operating effective. How can they operate effective when their leaders are in prison? So in the 1960s, the government was able to, to, to silence the black resistance movement in South Africa, right? And that is what that first sentence is saying to you. Right, then if you go on, black consciousness was also the breeding ground for a new generation of leaders and the training ground for imparting organ, organizational skills. Right, so what does that sentence say? Um, a, a new generation was born. A new generation of leaders were, were born through the black consciousness movement. Um, because, I'm going to repeat, Mandela and them, they were silenced. People went, you know, people weren't even, Mandela couldn't speak from prison. They were very strict there. Um, but now we had new leaders. We had Steve Beaker and them. Not part of the ANC, not part of the PAC. Uh, th this was a new, a new movement, um, a younger movement, a movement I believe personally who later on brought a lot more people. Right. Black consciousness succeeded in popularizing self-reliance as a viable which means a practicable liberation strategy. It became very popular. Um, this thing of self-reliance became popular in the liberation strug um, struggle. To say that blacks should not rely sorry, on the white liberals. They should rely on themselves. If they want money, they should raise that money themselves because they would just be so much more effective right? Uh, effective, right? It's initiatives in launching a student movement and adult political organizations, leadership training programs, and in, uh, enunciating or uttering a philosophy which accorded with the dignity of the downtrodden, burdened, and oppressed. Uh, served to demonstrate that self-reliance was attainable. To say that it was attainable means for black, um, self-reliance was reachable. They can or they could have achieved it. How? Through the philosophy of black consciousness. Right. Um, through launching a student movement. What student movement are they talking about here? Um, with my... You will have to be able to say, but they are talking here about Sasu. Why? Because Sasu was a student movement solely, only for black people. Right. They have a student movement where whites cannot be part of it. They will gain self-reliance. Right. Adult political organizations, leadership training programs. So that Steve Biko isn't the only leader of the black consciousness movement. There were many others. Right, um, with the dignity of the down, trotten or burdened and oppressed. Who was the oppressed? The blacks were the oppressed. Um, the coloreds were the oppressed. The Indians, right? Those who didn't have hope. Black consciousness gave them hope, right? The task um, black consciousness set were to uplift sagging spirits. They were, like I said, they, black consciousness wanted to uplift those people who, who saw no light, who, who, fe who felt hopeless, raise battered self-esteem, affirm identity, and assert human dignity. Fight off ap apathy and stagnation. They don't want them to stand still. They want them to go places. Turn racial stereotypes on their heads. Very important. What does that sentence mean? To say that um, 
if I would say all black people is this and all white people is that, that is, that is stereotyping because we have black people, we have white people, we have colored people, but they are different. We can have a black person who is the same as a white person. It's not to say that all black people are so, all white people are so, all coloreds are, that is, that is, that is stereotyping. People have different personalities. People differ. Right. Even if you are the same, if, if, if there's two white people sitting next to, um, next to each other or two black people sitting next to each other, they are still different. Right. Um, they wanted to turn that on there. They wanted to change that. Um, you know, the government was trying to say, but black people, what are they? They are going to be the workforce of South Africa. Um, but why can't they be also in management positions? Why can't they also become doctors, teachers, etc.? Right. That is what they wanted to, to, um, to change, that stereotypes. Right. Exercise, uh, exercise to get rid of the arsenal or the collection of complexes that haunted and kept down individuals and communities. They wanted to get rid of those things that, um, that, were, that were keeping some communities in the dark, that, that were keep, keeping them behind, right? Instill self-confidence and self-reliance to make black people confident about themselves. They can trust themselves. They do not doubt their abilities, right? Self-reliance to do things for themselves, very important. They wanted, the black consciousness wanted black people to do things for themselves to say no but I am not depending on certain whites maybe if it was government or whatever you know doctors we can do it for ourselves as well and reinvigorate the masses in their struggle for emancipation or, or then freedom right so um, if we can If we can now go to the, 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 if I can just put the, 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 um, the addendum aside first, and then we can maybe look quickly at the questions. The first questions, you will see that your, you must read your paper very, very um, carefully, because certain questions is only applicable um, to certain sources. We did source A now. So your first questions of your paper will be only questions with answers from the first source, right? Um, that's why you will see 1.1. We have 1.1.1 up until 1.1.3 if you, if you look there, right? Um, and all of those sources refer to source 1A. You do not go and look at source B or source C or, or, or whichever source for, for that specific um, question right now the first question there and, and I'm going to also look with you at the mark allocation so that you know how many marks or how many answers do you have to give to get the full amount of marks that you that you can get this is this is very important many times learners will only give one answer but it's expected of them in fact to give Two answers, right? The first question there, question 1.1.1. What, according to the source, source 1A, were the main aims of the philosophy of black consciousness? Very important. They are asking you according to the source. So you have to go and look at the source in order to answer that question. You cannot, with all your knowledge that you might have at the end of this year, still go and, and you know maybe what the aims were of the philosophy of black consciousness this specific question want you to look at the source and give the aims from the source so you have to go back to the source and and read into it right and how many how many answers do you have to go and give you have to give and uh, you have to give uh, two answers because it's two times one and you will be given a mark for each one of the each each one of the of the answers right uh, for time i will just i will immediately go to the to the memo uh, just to to show you what the answers would be here um, but these answers come from the source from reading 
the the um, the source, and it's it's right in the beginning. If if we if we read the source again, you will see it focuses on the philosophy uh, of black consciousness. Okay, black black consciousness became a doctrine of self emancipation. So self -emanci emancipation is your first answer, um, and a strategy for escape from the political doldrums into which South Africans had been cast in the 1960s. It was also the breeding ground for a new generation of leaders and the training ground for imparting organizational skills. It succeeded in popularizing self-reliance. So, what was it aiming at? It was aiming at to make blacks become more self-reliant. Um, it must move away, if you read now on the, on the, on the memo, from becoming ap apathetic and stagnant. It wanted blacks to, to move forward. It didn't want blacks to stay still. All of this you will see in the source. Um, to accord dignity to the downtrodden and the oppressed. To give them back their dignity so that they can be proud of themselves. Right. All of this you will find in the in the um, in the source right there is four answers there are four possible answers how many of these four must you give you must only give two you only have to give two because you only need two marks okay right if I can go back to the question then the next one 1.1.2 if you can read with me there why do you think that the black consciousness movement popularize the concept of self-reliance support your answer with valid reasons and here you will see the mark allocation two times two which means you have to give two answers but each answer would count for two marks if we looked at the first one each answer only counted one mark now here we have the uh, each answer counts, uh, counting two marks right to read the question again, why do you think that black consciousness, the BCM, popularized the concept of self-reliance? Support your answers with valid reasons, right? So, what they're asking of you is, why do you think the BCM movement was hammering on this thing that blacks should become self-reliant? Why was it so important for them to see that blacks are self-reliant? Because they ask you also, support your answer with valid reasons. So why would you say it was important that blacks was becoming self-reliant? Right, so if we go look at the memo again. Uh, right. Oh, sorry. At 1.1.2, it wanted black South Africans to do things for themselves. How can blacks remember apartheid, the government, or the white, let's say the white minority of South Africa, was basically, I don't have the exact number, but let's say it was 10% or it might have been a bit more um, in the 70s, 20% at most of the population. Now you have this minority of 20%. You might have had only 2% of them who was against apartheid, against segregation. How can you rely on them to, to gain uh, liberation for you. Do you understand? Um, how can you rely on, on, on a minority groups, on a minorities group, minority, to get you liberation? When in fact the blacks are the masses, they are more than 70% of the population. How can they then rely on that 1 or 2%, and it wasn't even that much, of white liberals to help them? Okay, so they wanted blacks to do things, or black South Africans, sorry, to do things for themselves. Right, and then that is one answer. That will give you two marks. Right, then the next one, it wanted black South Africans to act independently of other races. They, they wanted the blacks to, to, to not rely, like I've said, on the whites, um, liberals. They wanted them to do things for themselves. Because in that way, they are talking here in the source about stagnation. They are standing still. They will stand still if they are relying on the white liberals. If they take matters into their own hands, 
they will, that it will happen much quicker, right? And then the last one, I'm going through all three, but you only have to give two. Self-reliance promoted, self-pride among black South Africans. Very important, that, that answer. Because once blacks are self-reliant, once they start doing things for themselves, then you will find that there will be pride in being black. If they, are self, if they can do things for themselves, they will become much prouder. If, if they aren't doing things for themselves, if they are relying on these white liberals, how will they become proud of themselves? You cannot be proud of yourself if you are not doing things for yourself. Right, so this, this, this is a very good answer to say promoted self-reliance, promoted self-pride among black South Africans. Once they do things for themselves, then they will become proud. When you, are do, when, you, when you think of your own life, when you do things for yourself, you are proud of that thing. If you buy your own car one day, you will be proud of that. Not if someone else has bought it for you. So that is a very, very good um, question, uh, a very good answer. Right, then 1.1.3, if we look at the, at the question... List the four tasks that black consciousness movement set out to achieve. Right, so what does the black consciousness movement want to achieve? We will have to look at the source, and then, and then you will see four tasks. If, if you look at the mark allocation, it's four times one. That means you will give four answers here, and for each one of those answers, you will, you will get one. If you only give two answers, you, will only, you might only get two marks. If you give, get, give four, you will, you will get the, the, uh, the four marks, right? So if we look at the, the answers here, and this comes exactly from the source. What did black consciousness movement, what did they want to achieve? The first thing, to uplift sagging spirits. To, so it wanted to, 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 to the, they wanted to, um, to uplift those spirits of, 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 of people that were down, right? They wanted to, that's the first answer, to raise the battered self-esteem, um, to affirm identity so that the blacks are proud of their own identity as, as black people, to assert human dignity so that they feel like human, that they feel more proud of themselves, more proud of their that, that they feel they, they, if they, if they, if black consciousness wanted to give more human dignity to blacks, I mean, basic things here of separate facilities where there's toilets and in the schools, where things that they can be proud of, if, if, if it's, if it's, um, if it is, um, up to standard. You know, if you, if you looked at South Africa in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 1970s, where you had different facilities, let's take bathrooms at campuses, wherever. Sometimes, not sometimes, sorry, all the times, the white bathrooms, restrooms, were 10 times better than the black restrooms, okay? Um, and, and, and that is a part of the human dig dignity, right? To fight off apathy and to install confidence. Black consciousness wanted to make black people pr uh, proud of themselves, right? If we can go on to the, to the next source here, source 1B, the source describes the organizations that were established as a result of the philosophy of black consciousness. In addition, some of the younger teachers, also in Soweto, had come from the ethnically divided university or campuses of Fort A at the university and the University of the North where they had formed the um, South African Students Organization. The organization was based on the philosophy of black consciousness and was associated with Steve Biko. Right. Um, these young professionals had a major impact on emerging student organizations. Remember I said to you, some of the teachers came fresh from university, out of Sasu, and they then joined into, and, and they then spread these ideas amongst their learners at schools, right? Um, uh, the, these young professionals had a major impact on emerging student organizations, such as the 
uh, South African Students Movement, SASM, which were founded in schools. Some accounts even refer to the SASM as a school-based branch of SASU. So, if you would be asked, where do you think were more members? Remember, many, very few blacks were studying at university, but all blacks, or many blacks, were at the school. So, you know, SASM actually, I, I think, was a bigger threat to the government. Uh, SASM was a bigger, bigger threat to the government because they reached more people than SASU, right? Uh, statements by the SASM and the SASU reflected the growing excitement felt by young black people inspired by the worker strikes in 1973 in Durban, the fall, um, the fall of the Portuguese regimes in Angola and Mozambique, very important that, 1975, because now they were seeing that blacks in our neighboring countries of South Africa were gaining independence, <laughs> why can't they also achieve that in South Africa? The government, obviously, they didn't want blacks to take notice of, of these things, of, of, of other blacks in other countries, just next to us, gaining independence, because they, they would have said, but now these blacks will also try to gain independence, right? And the successes of resistant movements in the war in uh, Rhodesia. Right, so let's quickly go to the, to the question paper. If we look at source 1B, um, the first question there uh, at 1.2.1, why do you think SASU was established? If we can look quickly at the, at the memorandum, why was SASU established? Um, it was, SASU was formed to prop propagate the ideas of black consciousness. Black consciousness was only a philosophy. They needed the organization through which they could spread their ideas. And SASU was that organization, right? Say again, black, um, black consciousness, BC, was only an ideology, a philosophy, never organization. They needed the organization to spread their ideas, and SASU was that organization, right? To safeguard and promote the interest of black South African students. SASU was there to look after the black students at the universities and to promote them, right? You only need one answer, right? And then 1.2.2, if we can quickly look at the, at the question there. In what way was SASU linked to the black consciousness movement? Um, right, SASU was based on the philosophy of black consciousness. I said to you with the previous question, SASU had to spread the ideas of black consciousness. Uh, more importantly also, you only need one answer, but I'm just going to go to the second one quickly. Sasu was associated with Steve Biko. And Steve Biko started, the, he wrote the book on black consciousness, and now he was the president of Sasu. So what they're asking of you, was Sasu linked with black consciousness? And the obvious answer, yes. Why? Number one, Steve Biko was the principal, or the president of Sasu, and he was the founder of the philosophy of black consciousness, right? If you can look at the third question there, 1.2.3, name two events in and outside South Africa that serve to inspire black South Africans. And that you will find right at the bottom of your, of your source there, um, where they talk about the, the, the liberation of the Portuguese um, regimes, you know, where, where Angola and Mozambique gained independence. And then also the worker strikes of 1973. That is exactly from the source. If you look at the source, if you look at the bottom of the source, you will be able to, to get those answers, right? And it's again, it's two, it's, it's two times one, which means you have to give two of those events which took place, right? Uh, then quickly, can, uh, if we can go to the, to the, to the, the next question, 1.3. Very important, you will, you will find such questions where you have to compare sources. And in this case, you had to compare source 1A and 1B. And um, explain how the information in these sources are similar regarding the philosophy of the black consciousness movement. So you have to look at two sources and see a similarity in those sources. You will have to do this, this, this type of question would definitely be asked of you. So when looking at two sources, 
you must be able to see what are the similarities in, that, um, in those sources. And in this case, how is source 1A and 1B similar? Source 1A states that the black consciousness is a breeding ground for a new generation of leaders, while source B <coughs> sorry, states that Sasu recruited young trainee teachers from Fort Hare and the University of the North as members. So both of them are talking about new leaders that came forward, right? This is one similarity. Look at your mark allocation. It's two times two, which means you have to give two similarities. You, you, the marks won't be allocated to say source 1A, source 1B, and this is the, the thing that they say the same. No, you have to give two similarities. So what you can do with a question like this, write source 1A and source 1B, and then write source 1A and source 1B again. And then you know you are going to give two similarities. In this one, source 1A states that black consciousness wanted to launch a student movement, while source 1B states that Sasu was formed as a movement to propagate black consciousness ideas. Right, then question 1.4. Why, according to the source, was black consciousness seen as a threat? Uh, now we first have to go back to the addendum because now we have to look at source 1. C. This extract focuses on the reaction of the apartheid government to the philosophy of black consciousness. Very important. What were the government's reaction towards, um, towards the philosophy of black consciousness? How did they react? Right. Sasu's ability to pull off simultaneous boycotts contributed to the government's perception that black consciousness was a threat. It did not act immediately, but early in 1973, the Minister of State Security, followed by the banning of, of eight new SAS leaders, banned the leadership of the SASU and the BPC. Right, so if we go to the questions, I can't now go through the whole source with you, but um, why was black consciousness seen as a threat? And that is the first part of your of your of your of your source where they actually give that reason um, to say that it challenged the apartheid government that is why they posed the threat because very important the government was saying one thing and black consciousness came and it said the exact opposite if if the government was trying to tell blacks that you are inferior to whites that you have to rely on whites what did black consciousness do black consciousness taught them now you can rely on yourself um, you are not inferior to the white people, so it was posing a threat because it was teaching a different thing from what the government was trying to teach to blacks, indoctr indoctrinate them. Uh, black consciousness taught them the exact opposite, right? Um, then also, um, just to look at the next question quickly, name the four leaders that were banned by the apartheid regime. Uh, yeah, I can somehow go to the source with you. Um, they say the ba if you look here in the, in the fifth line, the band leaders included Wekulu, uh, Biku, Pidiane, and Cooper, Mutli, and Ma Mafuna. Right. So that question is very, very easy. It's 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 four marks that that you cannot throw away um, because you just have to write those names again. They are actually giving those names to you in the source. Uh, and if you can give the, the names of the four leaders, you will get the, 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 the four marks. That's a very, very uh, simple uh, question, right? Uh, why do you think Foster, PJ Foster, was the, mini um, the Prime Minister of South Africa during the 1970s? Why did he state that the events that unfolded in Mozambique would affect white South Africans, right? Let's just quickly look here at the, at the answers. Black South Africans would now be motivated to demand independence from white minority rule. If the blacks in South Africa can see what is happening in the neighboring countries where they are gaining independence against white rule, they would say, but why can't we also? Why must we then be oppressed? If they can do it, they look the same. They, they are also black. They are our neighbors. If they can do it. Why, must then, why then must we be ruled? by a minority government right uh, if we can go to the to the to the last question 
um, on this source, explain how anti-apartheid activists in South Africa commemorated the event, the end of Portuguese rule in Mozambique. Use examples from the source to support your answer, right? So if we look there at that answer, um, they intensified the struggle against apartheid. They organized rallies throughout the country and they held several anti-apartheid rallies. Right, um, if we can quickly go to, to question 1.5, you have to look at source D. What, what does source D look like? Now source D you will see is a, is a cartoon basically drawn by, by Sapiru. Um, you know, it, it commemorates the legacy of the former black consciousness leader Steve Bantubiko, um, struggle against apartheid. This was to 20 years later after his um, death. This is a visual source um, which you will, you will definitely get visual sources which is more difficult because you have to interpret them. Right, what message does the, this con cartoon convey regarding Biko? Right, um, now right at the top it says that the cartoon commemorates Biko's political influence in South Africa during the 1970s. So we now, 20 years later, we remember the role that Steve Biko played. Um, Steve Biko, if we look at the source, we will see he was the inspiration to most um, South Africans. And uh, yeah, you only have to give two answers here. Oh, no, sorry. You only have to give one, seeing that it's one times two. And then comment on the significance of the caption in the cartoon, Biko 20 years on, an indelible legacy, right? Uh, what is the um, significance of this is that even though Biko has, 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 has been dead for 20 years, his legacy still continued. Um, you know, Biko died in 1977. When did South Africa gain um, democracy? Only in 1994. And even up until today, the ideas of Steve Biko are still relevant. Even though he's been dead now for... for um, for more than 30 years, his ideas are still relevant to South Africa today. And, and, and Biko is one of our foremost political heroes in South Africa. Right, if we can look at the, at this, at the second last question, question 1.6, refer to source 1A and 1B and 1C and 1D. Which one of these sources would you consider to be most useful when studying the influence of the black conscious movement on South Africans in the 1970s? And yeah, I just want to show you what the memo looked like. Each one of these sources are in fact useful. Important here for you is to remember you choose one source that you feel. You don't go and, and you must choose one. You, ha you, have, you can't be choosing all three or all four of them. You choose one, otherwise they will anyway only mark the first one that you have chosen. But most of the time, uh, the sources are, all of them are useful most of the time. So the thing is just for you to pick one which you believe are the most useful. And how, how do you explain usefulness? You say, um, you tell the marker what the source is telling you. Right. If it can contain the ideas of black consciousness, if the source is written by Biko, for example, um, if it contains the ideas of black consciousness, what, whichever, you choose one source and then you explain why you chose that specific source. Uh, and then just lastly, if we can just look at um, the last question, this you will always find at the end of your Source-based questions is a question where you have to go and write the um, paragraph. And in this case, they're asking you, um, you write a paragraph of eight lines explaining how the ideas of black consciousness challenged the apartheid regime in the 1970s. So um, you use the sources and you use your own knowledge. And then you go write a paragraph 
You do not write it at, as it is here in your memo. You write a paragraph. You do not write it in point form. And you can, you can quote from the source, but then give recognition to your sources. Say from this source, this is what I have learned. But bring in some of your own words as well. Um, but, but look very specifically and very carefully at exactly what the, 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 the question is asking of you. To, to write on because in this case they are asking you explain how the ideas of black consciousness challenged the apartheid regime in the 1970s you have four sources there and and a lot of the things that are written on the so in the sources may not be explaining to you how the ideas of black consciousness challenged the apartheid regime it might say to you what did the apartheid regime do to oppress the black consciousness movement uh, but that is not what they want of you. They want of you to say how the ideas of black consciousness challenge the apartheid regime. So look very, very carefully because you must look at your source and take only out the ideas that are applicable to that question. All right, I uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope it has been insightful and I hope that... Uh, it helps you with your end of year um, preparation for the exams.